I'm Ruben Gutman, and I'm here in Emory University Law School's Albert Parr Tuttle courtroom with members of the Kessler Ides and Trail Techniques Program 20 Year Club. Um, Bob Vanderlane, Steve Wood, Dick Rubin, Roosevelt Thomas, it's terrific to have you here. 31 years of the program, and you guys have witnessed just about everything. Let's start off with you, Bob. How did you get involved in the program? Well, in 1991, I was trying a case of all places, Las Vegas, Nevada. And from the audience walks Art Mallory, who is an LLM graduate of Emory in the litigation part, one of the few LLM graduates in litigation in the country. And he said, have you ever heard of the Emory program? And I said, I have. He said, how would you like to teach in it? And I said, I, I would feel honored. And he said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to Tell them you'd like to teach, and I got an invitation. Here I am. Well, thank you. Steve? When I was a 1L, my civil procedure professor was the late Bill Ferguson. Fast forward a few years, I was graduated practicing criminal law in Delaware as a prosecutor, and one day my phone rang, I picked it up. Wood, Bill Ferguson! And I thought it was one of my classmates kidding around, and I responded in an inappropriate way, but it turned out it was Bill Ferguson. And he asked me if, uh, if I remembered the trial ad program, as it was called back then. I said I did. He asked me if I wanted to teach. I said, sure, and here I am. Now, you're Assistant Attorney General um, in the state of Delaware, working for Attorney General Bo Biden. When you say 1L, one thing you didn't tell us was you're an Emory Law School graduate. I am, and I have spent now 28 years as a prosecutor, and I have a career that I love and a job that I love, and I have it because of this program. In the middle of my second year, which is when the program was offered back then, I was a student in the program. Maybe he was one of my teachers. And uh, during a recess break, somebody came up to me, one of the faculty members, and said, you ought to think about being a trial lawyer. You're pretty good at this. And uh, you know, not to be too melodramatic about it, but it was one of those lightning bolts out of the cloud moments because I was having a great time in the program. The thought that I could actually make a living as a trial lawyer had never occurred to me, and um, I took his suggestion, and here I am. You know, as I'm asking these questions, I'm thinking about how I use my hands, whether they should be in my pocket, and these are certainly the things that you all taught me as faculty of the trial program for so many years. And, and Dick, you know, I graduated from memory in 1985, and you were there at the beginning, and you were a teacher in this program when I was there, and you were practicing in Atlanta at the time. How did you get involved, and tell me a little bit about what you're doing now. Well, <clears throat> actually, uh, I uh, came to Atlanta and uh, formed a partnership with uh, Marvin Arrington. Marvin was a graduate of Emory uh, Law School and actually one of the first two African-American graduates of the law school. And uh, Marvin uh, got me interested in the program. And uh, at that time, I was part of the local group that came here. And uh, when Abe Ordover established the, um, the program in 1982, uh, Marvin suggested that uh, I be one of the folks who uh, came over as local counsel. And I did, and I did that for a number of years. And then I was an adjunct professor at uh, Emory. Um, and I've never missed a year since it started in 1982. Quite special, and we've appreciated it. As a, as a student, and now an alumnus in Emory, and now as a co-faculty member with you, it's been a learning experience to learn from you and work with you. Um, Roosevelt Thomas, when I started teaching at the trial program, I think almost nine years ago, you were one of the first people I met and extended it in hand to me and showed me the way. Um, uh, you've had quite a career. I want to ask you, first, how you got in the trial program, and second, uh, the type of practice you've had over the years. Well, um, I got involved with the program through one of my mentors in Chicago. I was doing criminal defense work when I got out of uh, law school and uh, Judge uh, Earl Strayhorn, who uh, used to come down here and, and really was here the first year that it started because he and Abe were good friends through the Nita hookup. And so uh, <coughs> it was about 1980, 85 or 6, Judge Strayhorn said to me, I'm going to recommend you to Abe to go down and teach in the Emory program. And I, I said, because I had started, he had also recommended that I be in the NIDA program, which was 1983. And so it was about five, 85 or 86 
but I know the first year that I came was 1987. And uh, he had set it up with Abe, and I came down, and I, that's how I, I got involved in the program. I've been coming. Uh, I missed a couple of years when I moved from Chicago to, uh, uh, to back to Michigan, where I grew up. You mentioned what my practice was. It was strictly criminal defense when I was in Chicago, and I did that for, for 20 years. You know, you talk about big cases, and you talk about uh, <coughs> attorneys uh, coming to Emory to teach the students um, who have worked on big cases, and I, I would suspect that there's nothing bigger than a case involving life and death. And of course, the three of you, Steve, Dick, and uh, Roosevelt, uh, all of you have handled death penalty cases uh, from different ends of, uh, of uh, the perspective. So, you know, starting with you, Roosevelt, tell me, tell me what it's like to do that, and tell me about some of your experiences. The most, uh, well, it, this, it, it was a history setting case because it was the Pontiac, Illinois prison riot and three guards were killed and I was a young, young, just two years out of law school and I got involved. Uh, Harold Washington was the, mayor, was the uh, a senator and these 19 young men were charged with the murder of three guards and uh, I got involved in that program. Uh, the program, uh, it, it involved 19, 19 people. There were uh, uh, 344 pretrial motions that were filed. We were in court for six months from 8.30 in the morning until 5.30 in the evening with a break at lunch to hear all those motions. Jury selection took six, mo six months. Yeah. And because we had the, uh, obviously the uh, issue of the death penalty was there. And uh, each juror had to be uh, questioned separately once they were generally qualified to, to, to be there to see if they could, under the Witherspoon case, uh, see, to see if they could consider the death penalty. The trial itself took four months. Uh, we ended uh, the, uh, the uh, closing arguments w was May the 10th, 1983. And uh, I will uh, never forget that because we wondered how long the jury would stay out after, after all that time. They were sequestered the whole four months. And uh, we got a call two hours after the jury had went out and to come back that they had a verdict. So we went back to the courtroom and uh, Ben Miller was the uh, was a judge who was appointed from Springfield who, who eventually became the, the, uh, the chief judge of the Supreme Court of the state of Illinois was presiding. Tom Breen was the prosecutor in the case. And uh, in his closing arguments, <clears throat> he found out we had six alternates. And uh, he found out, and he looked at the jury box, and about eight of them were stone dead sleep. And so he looked up at them and he said, well, if you're not listening to me, I'm not going to say anything more. <laughs> so the jury went out and came back, and, and I remember when we got back in the courtroom, because uh, the, the lawyers had to come back from where they were dispersed, and it was on a Saturday because the judge wanted to get the trial over. And so we said to the judge, uh, Judge Miller, you know, if, if it's, we, Breen said, Judge, if there's 58 verdict forms, and if, it's, if they're all not guilty, please don't read all 58. Just say that we want, uh, that they're not guilty on all counts. And, and so we got up and objected. <laughs> and we said, no, Judge, we want, we want, justice to ring out in this courtroom 58 times if they're not guilty. And of course, Judge Miller said, came back and he looked at them and the jury reached a verdict and they were all not guilty. And uh, there were 10 people on trial and there, there, were, there were six waiting to go to trial. And uh, in that situation, the cases against them were dismissed. The only person who got any time out of it was a flipper by the name of Angelo, and Angelo turned against, these were all, all uh, gang, gang members. He turned against everybody and flipped, and, and he got time in jail and everybody else were found. I guess. You know, in the trial program here at Emory, we teach students, and uh, they're nervous when they first get involved. And of course, when you're, you were trying this case that you just talked about, that was when you were a young lawyer. Um, what does it feel like when you're a young lawyer and you have such a challenge in front of you? 
Um, do you feel up to the task? Do you ever feel up to the task as a lawyer when you're when you're a trial lawyer and somebody's life is on the line <coughs> or an important case? Well, I I had an experience when I was in law school at the University of Notre Dame where we had a case and I was involved in it. The lawyer and I was a law student. The lawyer didn't believe in my in the, our client's innocence, and, and I did, and I worked on the case, and eventually, uh, and it went to trial, and, and and I got an opportunity to participate in that trial, and the jury was sequestered overnight, and we finally won the case, and it gave me a lot of confidence. It, it, what it said to me is that you know you you seem to have a knack for this, so go for it. I I, I cut my teeth on Perry Mason, and every Sunday at eight o'clock, I was there watching him and Berger, and Berger got his butt kicked every Sunday at about 8.30, he was done. And, and that's, that's really what I wanted to be as a kid, I, and so I kind of stayed with it. Yeah, uh, Roosevelt talks about Perry Mason. Bob, how has the practice of law changed since we all were watching Perry Mason? Well, I think there are more and more TV programs that have recognized that uh, trial practice is a very interesting thing to do. Because when you watch TV now, uh, you've got reality TV, which is court TV, and you've got drama series that show trials almost on a nightly basis. And I think that's been a huge change since Perry Mason. The fact that people are interested in watching trials, uh, you've got movies like My Cousin Vinny, which from a comedy standpoint uh, show the lighter side of trial work, and it's a pervasive thing in our society. Mm. You know, Dick, I want to get back to you and, and mm -hmm. you're, a, you're in Idaho now, right? I am. And you're the public defender for Idaho. I am. I'm a <coughs> federal defender there. Federal defender. And uh, you've got a bunch of people who are counting on you to save their lives. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we have a capital habeas unit and our capital habeas unit represents uh, 13 uh, inmates on death row in Idaho. Uh, four inmates on death row in California, uh, one person in Nevada, and one person in Oregon. And some of the folks who we represent have been on death row, and we've been representing them uh, in excess of 20 years. Uh, and our job in those cases is simply to keep them alive. And we've, you know, knock wood, we've been successful in, in doing that. So uh, that, that has been a challenge, and it's... Um, uh, it, it just takes, I think, a special type of, of office uh, in order to do that, and people working together with a common mission. Um, and, and so far, we've been very fortunate in being able to do it. You know, and Steve, you're on, you're on the other side. You're on the <coughs> prosecutor side, right? So tell me about some of the cases that you've uh, prosecuted over the years. Well, in one sense, I'm on the other side, but in, in a real sense, all four of us as trial lawyers are on the same side. People come to us, whether it's a victim's family member, a criminal defendant, a whistleblower, someone who's been seriously injured in an accident, and they're saying, get on that white horse, be my knight, be my champion. And one of the things in my own professional development that's been absolutely instrumental were the skills that I've learned here first as a student and now watching these master trial lawyers at work teaching because I have some sense and some confidence that I am worthy of the trust that the people who come to me seeking justice bestow upon me. Um, in, back in the early 1990s, I prosecuted a death penalty case that was unique in the sense that it's probably the only time I've ever prosecuted someone while having the real sense that if I wasn't successful and if he wasn't executed, he would absolutely kill again. And so I felt like I had someone's life in my hands, even though I didn't know whose life that might be. Uh, this, this was a person who was convicted out west on an Indian reservation in 1983, so it was a federal crime. He went to, he went to jail. That was murder number one. He was in California and escaped, and while he was on escape status in 1987, he killed two more people. He went back to prison, killed someone else in gang-related violence in the federal government's most secure prison in Marion, Illinois, his fourth murder. And then someone got the uh, bright idea of moving him to Delaware and putting him in the Federal Witness Protection Program where he committed his fifth murder. So he'd killed in prison, he'd killed after escaping from prison, he'd killed on parole, and it was clear that he was going to kill again. Uh, it was a case that I knew 
we had to be successful with or someone else was going to die. The skills that I learned here gave me the confidence to think that we could do our job and protect society. You know, let's follow up on that. What strikes me about the four of you is that you are extreme masters at your craft. And my observation is, is you don't work for big firms where you've got, you know, 20 associates that you can delegate work to. It's all about your own ability and what you do in a courtroom. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about that. If somebody comes out of a trial program and they really have the skills um, to represent somebody, I mean, what can you do? Tell me about some of the cases you've, you've done, Bob. Ruben, I've got to tell you that I have been blessed as a lawyer and in particularly uh, blessed as a uh, trial lawyer. I started out a law clerkship when I was in law school with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Detroit. And I was immediately thrown into something called the Jimmy Hoffa investigation. Most people these days don't know who Jimmy Hoffa is, and they never did find the guy, unfortunately. But from there, I went into a very small private practice and soon got caught up in a 91-day trial of an antitrust case. And since then, I've tried just about every type of case you could try, from murder, antitrust, business tort litigation, you name it. Now, I did work for a while at one of those very large law firms, and I have to tell you that uh, there are litigation departments in very large law firms that are spectacular. The firm that I was with is an example of that. The problem is that unless you're in a small law firm, uh, or particularly uh, a small litigation shop, you're not going to be able to have the variety of trial work that you might want. Everything from criminal defense work to, uh, like I said, the business tort stuff. So uh, once, once you get adept at trying cases, uh, the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure, criminal or civil, are the same. Uh, it's just the area substantively of the law that you need to learn. Let's tap into your expertise as masters of your craft. You're a young lawyer coming out of law school. You're hanging up your own shingle. And uh, maybe, Dick, you're going down to the superior court and you're getting assigned criminal cases, right? That's how I started out. Yeah. Matter of fact, my first law firm, and this was the beautiful thing about that firm, they insisted that you get on the appointed list because they said that's where you're going to get trial work. And I was on the appointed list for state court litigation, federal court litigation, and federal court appellate litigation. No better experience than taking those appointed cases. So Roosevelt, would you agree, I always thought, tell me if you agree with me, that if you have a law degree and you're admitted to practice law and you know how to try a case, you could never ever be in a position where you'd say that you're unemployed. You may not have clients, but you're never unemployed. <laughs> Well, you know, the, when I first started out, uh, I remember sitting in, in my office one day and I, I said to myself, you know, if I don't get a client in pretty soon, I'm going to go rob a bank and hire myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> fortunately, somebody came in the door shortly after and I didn't have to resort to that. But, but, but you know, it, it was, I was fortunate. I got in with some, some people who, who took me in, in, uh, in they, 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 my, the critiques that I got, uh, you can't do with students here in, at, at Emory today because they would think that I was picking on them or something like that. Because you know it was really pretty simple. You know, uh, they, 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 for instance, uh, why did you ask that sissy question? Did was the light green? The light was green, wasn't it? You know, and so and they told me, and and, and I was like a sponge. They tried to, they hated Notre Dame where I went to law school. They talked about Notre Dame and, and uh, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't deter me. I mean, you, you, and I was right there the next day. Uh, try, I was a sponge. I wanted, I wanted this life. I wanted this life. And, and I, I will tell you that it was something where, you know, this, this is the way I see it. People come in off the street, they don't know you. They come in, they sit down, they will tell you things that, 
your, they won't tell their mother, mm -hmm. their father, their sister, their brother, their, their spouse, their pe preacher, but they'll tell you. And then they'll reach in their pocket and give you money to represent them. And then, you know, and, and so it's, that's a privilege that we have. This is not something that, you know, that, you know we, it's, a, it's a privilege, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a duty, it's something that I take very seriously. Because the one thing that I can say that in the, at the middle of the day or at a time that, that a person comes up to me and they got a new house, they got some money, or you get a kid off and they give you a big hug, you, you really know that you have accomplished something in your life. And that's why I'm a lawyer. Because I feel like I can get some gratification, instant gratification, particularly when I go to trial. And Dick, I know you feel that way. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> yeah, when, when, I, when I first uh, came to Atlanta from Iowa, we didn't know anyone in Atlanta, and so I would go to the jail every Monday uh, because we didn't have a public defender system uh, in Atlanta at the time, and I would be assigned cases, much the same as I think Bob was talking about being appointed, and I would get $25 uh, for each case that, that I handled. And I handled uh, those cases for a while, and they were misdemeanors, and then I was raised to the exorbitant sum of $50 for felonies. And that's gradually how I, I started uh, my practice. And uh, uh, over the years, um, more and more people came uh, to, to see me, to hire me. The great thing about being the type of lawyer I think that Roosevelt and I are um, is, is that we didn't have to be accepted by banks. We didn't have to be acceptable to insurance companies. We just had to go out there and make sure that we represented our clients, that, that we were in their corner, that, that uh, we shared uh, what, what, they, what they had. We shared their, their backgrounds uh, with other people and said, you know, what these people are not guilty or there's a reason for them to have done what they did because the folks that we represent are people that are not well liked in the community they are powerless they're voiceless they're marginalized and um, it's just a, a situation where but for the grace of God many other people have 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 gone but 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 these people made a wrong turn at, at some point of their lives and I, I think Roosevelt and I feel very much the same and that is uh, I've been practicing for 45 years now and uh, I don't think there's ever been a day when I have when I have gotten up and not been thankful that I chose the occupation that I've chosen. I, I assume you were admitted to practice law when you were two. <laughs> well no unfortunately not. Okay. You know uh, Steve I wanted to ask you right we have we have these young lawyers or prospective lawyers who come out of the trial techniques program um, what are some of the mistakes they make, or what are the some of the, what are the some of the things that you can tell them, right, in order to correct those mistakes? What are the common things you've seen over the years that you try to correct through the program? I think the most important thing that any trial lawyer can can learn is that you're going to screw up, and that it's okay. And the question is, what do you do when you make that mistake? And there's only two ways to learn the things you have to learn to not make those mistakes. One is to attend some kind of a, a trial advocacy program, whether it's the one in this school or a program offered by the National Institute of Trial Advocacy, something like that. And the other is go to trial. You can't be a trial lawyer unless you go to trial. And that's not as easy to do today as it once was, but the importance of it hasn't changed at all. All of the great trial lawyers on this faculty have all had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trials, and that's why they're great. And if you don't do that, you can't, uh, you can't run in that league. Dick, can you remember how many trials you've had? Or oh, I, too many? I couldn't even imagine. I mean, the misdemeanor trials, you just try them and try them and try them. Roosevelt? Hundreds. Bob? I've always had a problem with that based on the antitrust case that I mentioned to you for this reason. That case happened when I was very young in terms of trial practice years and my colleagues who were doing a lot of criminal defense work and I would gather around wherever and well, how many trials did you have this year? I had seven trials this year. I had six trials this year. And they turned to me and they said, Bob, how many trials did you have this year? And I said, well, um, 
I had one. But it was for 91 days. <laughs> so how many trials is that? <laughs> I, I know the feeling because I had one like that. But let me put you on the spot. I saw you yesterday give this tremendous presentation, demonstration of an opening to about 270 students at Emory Law School of the second year class. And of course, I've seen you do this almost every year at the Trial Techniques Program. What I want to ask you is, and you don't have to answer this, you can take the fifth if you want. Um, when you do that, when you do trials, as many as you've tried, are there times that you still get nervous? You know, I had a brief career playing basketball in a different life. And what I learned is that you don't really get nervous. That's adrenaline that's pumping through your body. And you need to learn to channel that adrenaline or that feeling of nervousness. But you never lose it. Ruben, I don't think you ever lose it. But the difference is, and I think this is a turning point, at least for me, in terms of trying cases. And when I noticed that, in my mind, I was being an effective trial lawyer like I would like to be an effective trial lawyer, is that I quit thinking like a lawyer and started thinking again like a human being. And I think the best I think the best thing a trial lawyer could have is a knowledge of life. If you know life, you know what makes jurors tick. If you know life, you know what makes clients tick, what makes everything tick. And I think to be a good trial lawyer, you need to know life. Let's talk, you've got me thinking about this whole process of putting a case together. We talk about theme and theory, right? The theory are sort of the mechanics of why the person is guilty or innocent. And the theme is, I think, maybe if you can correct me if I'm wrong, because you are the faculty here, the sweetener that makes it all palatable and says, oh yes, the jury says, oh yes, I understand it, right? Um, Roosevelt, what's the process that goes on in your mind when you're putting together, let's say, a theme and theories for a case, putting a case together? Well, I, gotta, I have to confess that uh, <clears throat> I, I had a, usually have a source that, that keeps me grounded, and that, that was, that's my, my mother. Uh, and uh, she, she, has, she had all these sayings. And so it was like, uh, I would say, okay, wh which one is this? It, uh, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Uh, uh, you know, that was one, that was one of her things, uh, her things. And, and I, would, I, would, I would revert to that because I wanted something that would resonate with the jury. And then the jury is, you know, you're, you're looking at people, normally you have about an average of an eighth grade education on the jury, but you may have an engineer and you may have somebody that dropped out of high school. So what you have to do is look at your, look at the jury and say, what, what, how can I bring the facts to them in a way that they understand so that they will decide the case on, the, on, on my behalf and my client. And so it's something, I've gone to the Bible, I've gone to great sayings, uh, I have a book of great sayings and, and stuff like that because you, you look for things that people can relate to and, and, and hopefully that, and, and if you stay with that theory all the way through, uh, a lot of times, you know, and then facts are facts. So you got good facts, you got bad facts, but that part of it is, is something that just comes, just comes to you sometime. You could be driving down the street and you could say, uh, something came up and, and you say, oh, yeah, I like that. Let, I'll go with that for this case, and that's kind of the way it is. You know, I, I, in the morning in the shower, uh, I'm driving down the street. I mean, your mind is always on what's what's which which wheel, the, the squeaky wheel that you got to deal with now, and you and you it, your your body, your your uh, in the shower particularly in the morning, things come to me, and I wind up spending more time in the shower than I than I think because it starts to. It starts to come to me. So you tell me trial lawyers get wrinkly. <laughs> yes, they do. You know, I, you know, I, I had a closing argument in a, in a death penalty case that it was a, it was an hour and forty five minutes, and we didn't put on any evidence. And the point is, is that I, I was sitting, literally sitting at, at a restaurant, and, and it started to come to me, and so I got something. I started writing, and I, and I got home, 
And then I went to bed. I got up the next morning and I, and I, you know, redid it a little bit. And I went to court and I did a closing argument. It happened to be a death penalty case. And one of the things about the death penalty is, is that uh, the victim, if when you, there are two, two parts to it. Is it guilty or, is, or can you save his life? So you have, you have this whole notion of uh, what, what, what's my goal? So sometimes you don't put on a case, but you put on a mitigation case. And one in particular I had where uh, this, this brother showed up, my client's brother showed up. They had killed a, a woman and took her car with this Marine uniform on. And I had never met the man before, and I put him on the stand. And I had been told by my mentors, I said, somebody's got to have some remorse, somebody's got to, somebody's got to cry. And so his, his grandmother, he stole her jewelry, she didn't like it, the teacher didn't like it, the principal didn't like it, but his brother, who was a Marine, and he came in in you know, a Marine uniform, it's a beautiful uniform. So he gets on the stand, and I go way back over there in the corner, and I say, tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury why they should spare your brother's life. And he started to talk, and as he started to talk, his voice started to crack. And his voice started to crack, and then he started to, to weep, to cry. And so I let him cry. And then I asked the judge, who I'd asked before the trial, judge, if I waive jury, will you give him life? He said, pick your jury, Mr. Thomas. <laughs> so I got, got some water. My client, I was the sixth lawyer that this kid had had. I was appointed by the judge. I had got the reputation in Chicago. If you, if you got a tough case, Get Roosevelt Thomas. He knows how to control these clients, and he'll do, he'll do what he can do. Out of 10 death penalty cases, I have nobody on death row. But the miracle was when he got the water and he went back and he started to talk again, at council table, my client was hiccuping. He had crocodile tears coming out of his, his eyes. And he, and he just, the, and, and, and the silence was the two of them crying together in that courtroom. And that's probably one of the most moving things that in my career that's ever happened to me. And the jury went out and they came back and they said they couldn't decide on death penalty, so he got life. But it's, in a way, it's kind of barbaric. But in another way, you know, you're begging and pleading for a person's life. And I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's, it's a feeling that, uh, I, I'm glad I don't have a lot of those anymore. <laughs> you, know, you know, a part of the process, as Roosevelt's describing, putting this case together, um, is really about this being part of your life, and you taking a shower and you thinking about it, or you driving to the store and you thinking about it, or you eating in a restaurant and you think about it. You can't separate, separate in your mind, you know, the end of the work day from, you know, your home life. Um, you know, Dick, you've had some pretty challenging cases. You must feel the same way. Yes, and I, and I think a lot of it goes back to what Bob was talking about, about relating to people. I think the more you can talk about your case to people who are not in the legal field, the better off you're going to be. If you have a friend who's a gas station attendant, if you have a friend who works in a magic market store, if you have a, a, a somebody in your family that does something entirely different, you some of the some of the the theories about your case or the test runs of your case, you can talk to those people and they'll give you an honest and true reaction to to your theory and how well your theory is going to work. It also is very very important, I think, for you to collaborate with other lawyers and bounce ideas off of them. If we have a case that comes into our office and it's going to go to trial, we'll put up paper all over a room and we'll just start writing different theories, however outlandish they might be. And then gradually we kind of uh, coalesce on a particular theory and, and that theory seems to be the prevalent one and then we kind of know we're on the right track. But it takes an awful lot of, of, of talking about your case with as many different people as you can find. You know, it always seemed to me that advocacy is a two-way street. It's not just about what I or you as an advocate says. It's about our understanding of the audience, right? And we use a lot of jury consultants today. 
And really what Dick's talking about is almost doing some kind of survey to, as a check against his own notion of what, uh, what's going to be received well uh, as information. You know, what do you think about it? What do you do to learn about the jury and uh, how do you hone your message depending on who the audience is? Uh, you know, Bob and Steve. One thing you've got to do that it sounds simple but it's critically important is you have to watch the jury all the time from the beginning of jury selection all the way throughout the trial, even if it means doing something that might be perceived as rude, turning your back on the judge so that you can watch the jury in the array behind you as jury selection is happening. Because the jurors will do things, whether they're rolling their eyes or smiling or sitting with their arms folded or nodding or not paying attention, that can help us uh, mold our theories and change witness strategies on the fly. A few years ago, I tried a double homicide case. A woman and her new boyfriend were killed. We said by the woman's ex-boyfriend, the defense was that the real killer was the woman's ex-husband because the, that theory fit the evidence of a, a crime of rage. And when I uh, was watching the jury's reaction to the defense cross-examination of the ex-husband, they were becoming more and more attentive through the lengthy cross-examination, and it occurred to me, they're starting to have questions about this guy. It was a long cross-examination, and, and it's starting to work. You could see the jurors leaning forward. You could see them writing down more and more notes as the cross-examination went on, which is usually the opposite of what happens. And so seeing that, uh, I did something that it really to this day troubles me. It was probably the right thing to do as a lawyer and maybe not such a great thing to do uh, as a thinking, feeling human being. But when the time came for redirect, I stood up, I strode um, midway into the well, I looked the ex-husband in the eye and said, Scott, forgive me. And I walked back to council table and hit a button which meant that uh, six foot by eight foot photograph of his wife's battered body that he'd never seen before was now in full display in front of the jury. <coughs> and I pointed to the monitor and just said, did you do that to your ex-wife? He broke down crying and it was over. And it was all that I needed to do. And the point is I wouldn't have done it had I not been watching the jury and had I not been attentive to the, ver to the nonverbal cues that they were giving me that suggested that the cross-examination was very effective. You know, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. sorry, no, no, on, I was going to ask you, on the civil side, you've tried some extraordinarily high-profile cases with some very important clients. And let me, let me throw a hypothetical out, as they do in law school. Uh, a client comes to you in a civil case, um, and you have to formulate the theme and the theory for the case, put the case together, and um, it gets to the point where you're thinking about what this jury's going to look like, right? Um, what kind of research, research do you do in order to pick the jury or determine what, what would be the best jury for your client? Well, first let me say this, because from the standpoint of trial practice, generally speaking, I have been around long enough to witness a phenomenon in jury selection that is uh, quite something. When I first started trying cases, the lawyers did all of the questioning in selecting juries. And at that time, lawyers were not doing a particularly good job at it because they thought jury selection was your first opportunity to give your closing argument. And judges hated that. And so then we had a phase where judges did all of the voir dire, the jury selection. And that wasn't good because it took the trial lawyer out of the equation for the most part. But now we've got a situation where lawyers are beginning to be able to ask those questions again themselves. And when you have that opportunity, you have that opportunity to look a juror in the eye and find out by asking simple questions, open-ended questions, sometimes leading questions, who are you? And what do you like? What don't you like? What are your attitudes? How do we know that you can be fair? And bottom line, whether you use jury consultants, good old-fashioned intuition, 
or horse sense or whether you just know life, the ability to look someone in the eye and just ask them simple questions helps you immensely in jury trial work. Well, gentlemen, as I've, as I've talked to you for the last half an hour, it's evident to anybody who's watching is that you are all splendid trial lawyers because of the advocacy and the way that you've delivered your message to me. So let me wrap up by asking each of you this final question. Um, why, why is a program like the one that Emory has here, the Kessler Eye and Trial Program, why is that important to young practitioners or would-be practitioners? Roosevelt? Well, I, I think <clears throat> I think the program is much more than a, a, a <clears throat> trial advocacy program. It's about uh, communicating. It's about learning how to communicate. It's uh, learning how to use your voice, L learning how to work with other people, uh, learning what what the whole system is about in terms of the trial issue. Learning in the end, they become not only people familiar with the rules and stuff like the exhibits that we teach them, but they also come out being a, a better human being. They come out with the understanding that, uh, you know, they're not often, this, that you have to get up and communicate to people and that you have to talk in a manner that people can understand you. And, and that's what I tell them. I said, you're going to be, you're going to be a better, you're going to be able to handle yourself in court but you're going to be a better human being. You're going to be a better individual when you finish with this program. That's the way I feel about it. Dick, what are your thoughts? I, I think that I, I look at the program as a door opener for, for the law students. I think there are students here who, because of the, their college background, feel that they are um, they are geared towards a certain practice of, of law. And it may be because of the fact that they have an economics degree or a finance degree or something of that nature and they think, I'm going to be a transactional lawyer. And then they come into this program and it opens the door that, that there's something else that's out there. And they say to themselves, you know, I've never thought about litigation. But, but, you know, after taking this program, I feel that I might really enjoy litigation or I might enjoy transactional litigation. And I think for, for all of those students, it gives them an opportunity to see something that they hadn't really thought about before until they're able to complete and take this program. Now, you know, Steve, you have it from the perspective that I have, which is faculty member, right, and participant. Both of us are graduates of the law school and this program. So it's special to me, I'm sure, as it is to you. Absolutely. You know, for me, the program is, is a recognition of the fact that when we're starting our careers as lawyers, none of us can see the arc of our professional lives. We may think at age 25 that we know what we're going to do as lawyers for the next 30 years, but the fact of the matter is we don't. We can't see the future. But here's what we do know. We're blessed to live in a country where disputes are usually not settled with guns or bombs as they are in lots of other places in the world. Disputes in America are settled in the courtroom. And as a lawyer, you're the kind of person to whom someone is likely to turn when they need help, when no one will believe them, when no one will listen to their story, when no one will stand up for them. And you might think that you want to practice transactional law, but you don't know when your next door neighbor is going to tell you a story that makes you so angry that you want to be an agent for change. And what this program does is it gives you the basic skills that you need to be that agent for change because in America, so much of that change happens in a courtroom as a result of a lawyer trying a case and trying it well. And that's what this program lets you do. Ruben, I did not have the good fortune to attend Emory Law School, but this is my adopted law school. I have taught in this program, the KEPT program, Kessler Edson program, for, as you said, over 20 years. This program is unparalleled among law schools in the United States for teaching advocacy in trial work, in litigation. I think law schools are jealous of this program. It attracts an international faculty. It attracts the faculty of the best trial lawyers you can, you can find. This program not only does that, but it parallels and matches trial practice programs 
that lawyers in law firms get offered from a training standpoint. And that's what keeps me coming back here year after year. It's this trial practice program at this law school. I love it. Well, if Bob, I could just say one thing, one other thing I'd like to add is that all we're friends. We look forward to seeing each other, being in each other's company. And that's another part of it, the camaraderie that we have over the years, uh, just, just, just seeing people. And, and it, it, it's, it brings us all together. So it, it's a great thing. Well, Roosevelt, as Bob was saying, you and Dick and Steve and Bob, of course, members of the 20-year club, have been one of the major reasons that this has been such a phenomenal program. You have helped make it a phenomenal program. You have helped continue to make it a phenomenal program. And you know, we have at Emory Law School graduates of this program who are on the federal bench, on the state bench, prominent prosecutors at both the state and federal level. We have a former United States Senator who, Dick, has been through this program when you were a faculty member. So those who have been your students uh, who have graced through this courtroom uh, have gone so with the education and uh, experience that uh, that you've given them, and, and the law school thanks you. I thank you. I thank you for for uh, for uh, teaching me all I have learned over the last last nine years, and hopefully we'll continue this dialogue again on another videotape. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. See you in twenty years. <laughs>